thumbs up. Now, can you hear me? Yes? Oh, that's, that makes a huge difference. All right. Um, feel free to unmute yourselves and shout your biggest hello to everybody. Hello. 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 Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Morning, everybody. Morning. Good morning. And there are just a few of us here in the church who are, you know, putting together the, the service. And I'm going to go ahead and ask you to mute if you need to now so we don't get too much of an echo. Uh, definitely give me a high sign if you keep hearing an echo. We'll just go through our announcements and we'll start with the um, quiet. And So let's see, sorry, we're, we're making sure that we don't have a lot of echoey sound going on here. Always a work in progress. I got it, I think we're good. Yeah, thank you, Alan. We have different uh, devices aimed at the different places where we make music. So we're, we're just making sure that we don't have echo from the devices coming into this Zoom experience. So bear with us if we get echoey and tell us to be quiet. So, so our, the, the next few weeks are fairly simple. We are looking forward to for next Sunday. Meg Phillips is going to be doing an interview with me about Honduras. So that will be next week's message. And then for the last few weeks of August, we will have Dan Weir once more as your guest minister while Chris and I just take a long weekend, as it appears, and then Sarah gets married again because she's while she got married in Manhattan, she wants to be able to wear her dress, so she's gonna probably come visit us and have some family time and maybe get to have some photos in her dress. So we'll, we'll probably be focusing on family for a few weekends. But church will continue. One way or another, there's always church because God's love doesn't stop for anything. <sighs> Meanwhile, remember that racial justice conversations will resume in September, so if you didn't get a chance to partake of those, and you would like to see what that's like, we would love to have you. Just RSVP to the church and let us know. The Cocktails and Conversations is going to continue this Friday, and then we're gonna take a two week break in August and resume again in September. And the Young People's Program is continuing on Mondays. We have a one o'clock leaders and training session usually, and then a Young People's Choir and Band at four o'clock as they prepare their music for us. And I have to say that Billy is both teaching instruments or working on instruments with our, our young people as well as working on vocals. So he's a man of many talents, as is Alan. We have quite the music team going on here. Those are the announcements that I have for the life of the church. Is there any other, not a prayer request, but are there any announcements about community things that we should be aware of that I didn't say. Meg's got one. Um, Billy was just speaking to our virtual choir this morning about the UCC conference choir that is looking for folks who want to um, try this out, really, uh, how to do a Zoom choir. And the first general rehearsal is next Sunday, the 16th of August at two o'clock. Um, I think Gail's probably gonna put something in an email anyway to you, but. If you're interested in trying this, Billy said he's going to really work not only doing the kind of stuff we do all the time, but to get people used to this format who might want to try it, have been nervous about getting into it, this is a good time to jump in. We're just going to sing one nice, not too difficult song, um, but there'll be a general rehearsal starting at two o'clock next Sunday and again on the 30th and then a couple um, rehearsals for individual parts in between that, but that would be good. And then I have another, well, no, that's, that's my announcement. <laughs> Any other announcements for the life of the church? You'll have to unmute yourself and speak up if, if I'm not seeing your hand and you wish to say something, but it looks like we're pretty well covered. All right. Um, we will be keeping you posted because we do have traditions of 
doing the walk for Jen's friends, doing the walk for Alzheimer's, and there are a couple of other walks that people do. And we want to continue those even if they're done in new and different ways. So we'll probably plan a couple of church hikes that are sort of our walks for these different causes. We can't be doing that in large groups, but we can certainly be spread out or you can find a way to do it on your own. So please do watch as we will send out information about supporting some of our traditional causes and getting out and moving to do that. I'd like it to take us now to a moment of silence and centering. We, this morning we are having music. It's, it's the Sonata Number no. 5 for classical guitar and viola, the first movement. This is played by guitarist Ken Turley and viola player, performer Karen Weber, friends of Meg, who gave permission that we might use this music during our worship. And so we are grateful to Ken and Karen for their musicianship and for the invitation that was extended to them to share it with our community. So please gather yourselves and focus as we listen to this song together. And again, our gratitude for those that offer us their gifts of music. I'm, I'm using both microphones now for some different, for a couple people that are sitting here and listening in person. Can you all hear me without too much echo? Okay, great. We move now into our time of prayer. And we do have a couple of prayer requests that have been raised up in particular. We have several members of the community who are undergoing radiation at this time as part of their treatment for cancer. And so in particular, we lift up people that are living with cancer in all the different stages of that journey. May the light that is holy light enter these bodies and separate the healthy from the unhealthy and create an environment that sustains the healthy and lets the unhealthy go. May there be healing for those who need it if it is at all possible. And we pray this too for people that are undergoing forms of surgery or other chemotherapeutic or other treatments for cancer as well. 
we have a beloved family member not immediately in this community named Barry. We have a lot of berries in this community. Um, and we have a new Barry we've added to our prayer list, in addition to the Barry for whom we always pray. This Barry is um, a family member of the Perkins, and he is Derek's father, and we uphold him in prayer as he seeks healing while part of his family is so far away in his commitment to the military. May the ties that bind us be stronger than the distances that separate us. And may the love that can't be there physically be present in all the ways that are most tangible and important for those that are feeling lonely or isolated or vulnerable. And we pray this for Derek and his father Barry and for the Perkins family. If you wish to lift up a prayer concern, please unmute yourself and go ahead and share any prayers. We're going to start with prayers of concern and then we'll move to prayers of celebration. So I have two prayers coming in. Let's go with Wendy first. I heard Wendy's voice. Uh, thank you. Um, I'd like prayers for my son, Jim, who's recovering from a torn retina, and also his daughter, who underwent eye surgery in both of her eyes this week. It was just a coincidence. They've been making lots of trips to Mass General Eye and Ear and Tufts, but I think things are looking up, so I'm thankful for that. So prayers for the parts of our body that need love and attention, our eyes and our ears and so many other parts of our bodies. And I'll name them in just a moment. But there was another prayer request that was coming in at the St. Sue. Yeah, go for it. Yes, I just wanted to mention prayers for my friend Roland as he recovers from uh, his surgery. And it's, it's kind of a tough road. So... Um, prayers of encouragement and for healing, please. So prayers for Roland and his recovery from surgery. We've had many, many people undergoing all kinds of surgeries and procedures yeah. of late. Um, people are having biopsies and reparative and restorative surgeries. I may have made up reparative. So for the ways that people are seeking to take care of themselves and the recovery that comes in the wake of that and often that may come with news that is life-changing or startling and, and sometimes positive, we ask for the presence of the healing and the Holy Spirit in these places and may we show up as the hands and the feet and the heart of that love in the lives of each other. Gail? Yes, Kevin. I want to say prayers for um, Jeanette, Alex, Irene, Antonella, and those Ipswood youth group kids. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Kevin's thinking about members yeah. of the community with whom he feels very connected and extending prayers for everyone. Uh, we have a friend whose father died, Steve, mm -hmm. and uh, just if we could keep him and his family in our prayers, please. And what is his first name, Mom? Um, the gentleman was named Jake, and his, his son is Steve and wife Beth. Thank you. So prayers of gratitude for the life of Jake and prayers of consolation for his children, for his son, Steve, and his wife, Beth. Steve's wife, Beth. We, of course, lift up the family that was affected particularly by the storm this week. Um, many of us saw trees down and power out. Businesses lost inventory, but one woman's life was lost when a tree came down on her home. Um, and again, these are events that are sudden and they change everything. 
And so for, for simply recovery for those who have been adversely affected by that storm with gratitude again for all those that are called out into the midst of the maelstrom and its aftermath to put it into order and restore our lives, but especially for the loss of life and the grief that comes with it this week in the valley that gives pause and makes us think differently about everything around us with gratitude for what we have when we weather these storms. Alan, did you have a prayer? Alan asks for prayers for the people that are closing on his house. Alan is one of many people in our community who are considering, well, are, are moving residences or are in the midst of making a choice to let go of beloved homes. There are people that are doing this with great pain and people that are doing this with great anticipation. And all the different ways that this is happening are difficult. I see Roy. Roy would like to pray also. Yeah, we're asking prayers for our daughter who is interrupting her chemo, <coughs> excuse me, chemotherapy treatments for a week to have a cyst removed from her neck tomorrow. And Roy and Nancy, will you say again your daughter's name for everyone so that they can hold Kristen. Kristen. So for Roy and Nancy's daughter, Kristen, who is being treated for cancer and is also now having a cyst removed, so multiple um, challenges at once. Um, ongoing prayers for Deanna, for Cheryl, for Claire. There are so many of us living with particular challenges. Um, prayers of gratitude again for Jan's whole heart and for Barry's ongoing life with the challenges that are now part of their reality together. And prayers also for Joyce and Richard, for Paulette. Prayers of gratitude, do we have any celebrations? I do. <laughs> Go for it, Meg. Um, I want to have everybody help me celebrate my sister, Kate, who's here this morning, and today is her birthday. Oh. So, happy birthday, Kate. All right. Well, you know what that means. This is, again, the, um, the uh, happy birthday song, Unchained, meaning everybody unmute. You're all singing together. Before we start, yeah. This sounds like a dirge every time we sing this. I'm sorry. Can we pick it up a little bit today? <laughs> All right, then you're setting the beat, Jeanette. You can lead. You're leading. Yeah. One, two, okay. three, follow Jeanette. Happy One, birthday two, three, to, three, to three, you. Happy, happy birthday, birthday to you. you. Happy birthday, Jeanette. Happy birthday to you. you. Love you. I didn't even ask if there were other birthdays that we should be celebrating. Sure, or not, it was wonderful. <laughs> we got a pause from Barry Thank Chisholm. You. Thank you. Um, there you go. We're, we're, we're probably not going to take that on the road, however. I'm also <laughs> going to say a prayer of gratitude for the new life of a colleague's grandson, Xander, who was born just a few weeks ago making her grandmother for the first time and in the midst of all the things that are going on to have a hopeful event like that, much like a birthday, we are uh, grateful for reminders of the celebration of new life. Other prayers of celebration? I'll go, Gail. <laughs> go for it, Kevin. I met two young boys with their families at the campground and I saw God in these young boys mm -hmm. and I don't know why some people want to be some adults want to be hateful and hurtful 
um, I don't understand why they don't want to be like these young boys and have peace, love, harmony, and kindness in their hearts and minds. So I'm grateful for those two little boys. Thank you, Kevin, for the reminder to look at our children as a source of hope and a template for what is possible in the world. Well, I'm going to ask you to pray with me now. Oh, holy God, you are the one who knows our hearts. You hear us, you see us, you see all of your children, not just some of us. And you, you are the one who fills us with love and possibility, the one who is present in all ways and in all things and makes all things possible. You have heard the places in the world that we lift up or the people in the world. And we think too of our partner communities, both in Zimbabwe and Honduras and other places. We think of our brothers and sisters here in the valley of our siblings all over the world, but our brothers and sisters in faith, wherever they may be. Help us to become the ones that hold each other's hearts with tenderness and compassion and mercy and hope. We ask you to hear our silence now. And now, friends, I ask us to pray together as the Lord first taught us. Unmute yourselves, please, so that we can hear each other. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, and now if you would uh, be so kind as to mute yourselves again, that would be very helpful. Thank you. So this morning we have excerpts from chapters 11 through 15 of Acts as the text. We are going to narrow down to one little passage in that scripture, but we will share with you a portion of the story that was studied this week by the study group. Acts of the Apostles, excerpts from chapters 11 through 15. Now those who were scattered because of the persecution that took place over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, and they spoke the word to no one except Jews. But among them were some men of Cyprus and Cyrene who, on coming to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists also, proclaiming the Lord Jesus. The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number became believers and turned to the Lord. News of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. So it was that for an entire year they met with the church and taught a great many people, and it was in Antioch that the disciples were first called Christians. Now in the church at Antioch, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. 
Then Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. They went on from Perga and came to Antioch and Pisidia. And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the law and the prophets, the officials of the synagogue sent them a message saying, Brothers, if you have any word of exhor exhortation for the people, give it. But when the community leaders and traditionalists saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy. Then both Paul and Barnabas spoke out loudly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken first to you. Since you reject it, we are now turning to the Gentiles. When the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and praised the word of the Lord, and many became believers. The same thing occurred in Iconium, where Paul and Barnabas went into the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks became believers. But the residents of the city were divided. An attempt was made to mistreat them and to stone them. The apostles fled to Lystra and Derbe. After they proclaimed the good news, they returned to Lystra, then on to Iconium and Antioch. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. When they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there they sailed back to Antioch. Then certain individuals came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, My brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice, that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon called Peter has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them. Then the apostles and the elders with the consent of the whole church, decided to choose among their members to send them with Paul and Barnabas. They sent leaders with the letter, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden than these essentials. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. So ends the reading. So we know that that's a lot of text, a whole lot of text. And on our study times, we look at maps, and I will show you a map or two, but we want to bring that text into our current times. And so I ask first that you will pray with me as we dive into this text together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So what I want to think about is this idea that God knows our hearts. In particular, there is one line that really stood out to me. And it is that line that Peter speaks. And I'll give you the context momentarily when he says that God knows our human hearts and that God has chosen not 
to make a distinction among us. That God has sent the Spirit not just to some, but to all. And that this is the proof that God claims all of us and that God will make a people out of all those that hear and turn towards God. In these days and times, as we are anxious because of COVID, because of the social unrest, because of political divisions, because of all the ways that we feel tribal and apart from each other, when we don't even know if school will open in a few weeks, when we can't make plans, when everything that we did think we were gonna do has been overturned, our vacations, our children's weddings, some things have been changed irrevocably. And then in the middle of everything else, as we hear through the prayers of the people, life continues to happen. People have biopsies, they have to go for treatment and they have to go through the doors of the hospital by themselves because even if they're driving with someone, to, to protect people, you must go by yourself into places that you once would have had companionship. There is so much uncertainty and stress going on. And I'm going to tell you that I'm one of those people, and I think many of us are, that in those times, I try to impose whatever control I can on life. I used to look at my, my calendar and I would write down whatever timelines I did know and, and have little checklists and to-do lists that kept me organized and gave me a sense of control over the few things that were within my grasp. Certainly when our daughter was living with cancer is a great example. I had a whole little leather binder and I read everything and I tried to become an expert and I, I wrote down every medication and all the milestones that we were supposed to aim for. And then I learned very quickly, our whole family did, and I think all of us have learned this again and again in life. Control is an illusion. And when we think that we are going to be able to map something out and it will go exactly as we hope it will, it doesn't. And in times like that, we also start to impose other kinds of control. We try to figure out who belongs. I don't know about you, but I'm scanning the roads right now looking at people's license plates. And if I see a license plate that isn't from New England, I grumble. What are they doing? What did they bring with them into this place where I feel slightly more safe? Why are they coming here and bringing stuff with them? You know, when, nine months ago, I wouldn't have looked at it like that. I might have said, well, they're going to use a lot of parking spots, but I'd be happy for our businesses that there were people spending their money here and that people chose to find connection with the outdoors and creativity and creation here. But now, there's as much fear in the way that I look at somebody's license plate as there is welcome and hope. And we know that that's for very real reasons. But it makes our world smaller in a weird way. And I think some of that was going on in the times of the text that we're talking about here this morning. The church was, was just getting started. We, we hear that in Antioch, the first use of the word Christians happened that became not those that were God-fearers or traditionally Jewish people, but there was this new growing movement of people that had heard about the life of Christ and had heard that there was a different way to follow or a way that was built upon the tradition of Christ's very Jewish roots and then expanded upon it and reinterpreted it and made it even more different. And so much of Christ's own life was overturning all expectations not being with those that were in the in crowd and had power and popularity or, or were acceptable to everyone, but seeking out those that were so far from that. And yet again and again in the early church, people had to relearn that lesson that Christ had already shown by his life. So while they're working with this young church in Antioch, there are a bunch of guys from Jerusalem who think that they should be in charge of everything happening in every other community. So there's, there's a question of authority going on. And they send people down there and they tell everybody, you know, you need to be circumcised or you can't belong to this church because that was how the mark of belonging in the Jewish community. 
And they weren't wrong that within Jewish tradition that would have been the expectation. But to assume that adult males were going to suddenly become circumcised so that they could follow in the way of Christ, or that people would follow other um, ways of living that were culturally important to the Jewish community that defined who they were, but were alien to these growing integrated communities was a, was a problem. And Paul and Barnabas pushed back on it and disagreed with them and took the whole argument right back all the way to Jerusalem to this council of elders and put it before them and asked for relief from this expectation that people had to live under the strictures of Jewish law primarily. And this is when we hear Peter say, God who knows the human heart testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Peter, who was vying with Paul for authority in the church, and in the Acts of the Apostles is upheld as the patriarch of the church, puts his stamp of approval on the work that Paul and Barnabas are doing there, but he says that his approval is derived from that of the Holy Spirit. He can see that God is already moving in this community. God has already drawn them one to another. They've already shown that they see in each other God, that they are finding a new way to live together, and that the doors need to be flung wide and the heart needs to be open to this way of being connected to each other, and that it is uncomfortable and different from what the people, the elders, the council in Jerusalem might have expected to happen. But they seek permission for that little young community to grow in its own way, in its own fashion, and show them what God can be and what God can do in the world. That the checklist for what you should do in order to belong just doesn't work. We know, I, I made a joke before, when you walk through the doors of this church, we're not going to give you a test and say, hey, if you don't know these three things, you can't sit down in a pew. Even though there's very few of us coming into the building itself, anybody who shows up, and if please wear a mask to keep each other safe, you can sit down in the pews and be with us, and you will be welcomed. We... We seek to, to impose rules and, and ways of test for belonging when we're anxious. And that's not wrong. There are things that we should do, but right, masked or unmasked is a big question right now. And I, I have my own thoughts and opinions about wearing masks. I simply say that when we look at each other, it's so easy to put each other into different camps and, and across a fence or a wall or say you're on the other side of the line or the outside or the inside of that door. God is turning your heart into a doorway. God knows your heart and God knows how imperfect your heart is and yet God chooses each of you as God's own children, as brothers and sisters of the way. And God asks that you will fling wide the doors of your heart, that you will open the portals of your being making yourself vulnerable that you might be in connection with people that in some way or shape are different from you, that make you look twice at the license plate on the car and think, hmm, do they really belong? And be curious, be curious, why is somebody seeking to be here? What's going on in their lives that brings them into your community, our community? that brings them into connection with us and each other. We do want people to be responsible in, and respectful and courteous in the ways that we, we are in community. And we know that you know people are parking too tightly, jamming the waterfall with, with their cars and double parking where they shouldn't park because they're seeking some kind of comfort or some kind of connection 
when they feel so unsafe somewhere else in their lives. I'm not saying that we should live only in chaos, but I am saying that be a little bit curious. Be a little bit kind and compassionate because your response to what you see and the ways that you interpret it and the ways that you exude that energy may change for someone else how they then connect with the world, with us, with each other, and how they go forward in the choices that they make. I want to offer you a brief prayer that comes from John O'Donohue about this opening up of our hearts and how we might live each day in the midst of all of this anxiety and stress that we are undergoing as a community. It echoes the challenge that was laid down by Peter and Paul and Barnabas, those early leaders of the church, to make the tent bigger, to open our hearts, and to let others show us a new way to live in community, simply by saying this prayer together. May I live this day compassionate of heart, clear of mind, gracious in awareness, courageous in thought, generous in love. Let this be our prayer today as God looks into our hearts and pries open those places that we have closed off and helps us grow as people. Thanks be to God. Brothers and sisters, each week I remind you that as we move through these times, we continue to be the vibrant church in this valley. We've added another worship service to our mornings, and we continue to be alive and at work all over both Mount Washington Valley and other parts of the world, as we'll hear next week from Meg about Honduras. Please continue to support us. You are part of the light that we shine into the world. And so through your donations, through your ongoing pledges, whether you mail them in or you put them through online at jxncc.org, please continue to keep up with us as we keep up with the world. Thank you for your ongoing faithfulness to this community. At this time then, let us sing together. We have the song, It's Me, O Lord, Standing in the Need of Prayer. And so for this, you can mute yourselves. We do have voices underneath to help us and please enjoy singing together.
Okay, everybody, and we're going to move right into the benediction, which once again has the music played underneath it and the um, voices will be underneath it as well as the words. So you can remain muted and sing together. And then after that, Alan is going to play us out. He'll give us a brief snippet of music, then we'll chat for a few minutes and then he'll play us out with a postlude. So please um, enjoy the benediction now. <laughs> 